Good morning, and uh, again, we'll continue with uh, this next, next session. We'll have some others that are probably coming on the end, and we'll welcome them, but uh, we want to be respectful to give these outstanding panelists, these three gentlemen here, plenty of time uh, to participate this morning. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them briefly. Uh, their bios can be much, much longer than what they are, but I think for the sake of time this morning, and I'm going to start with Dr. Julius Friedrichson, who is to our immediate uh, right here. Uh, he is at the University of South Carolina Health Science Distinguished Professor in the Department of Communica Communication Science and Disorders, Smart State, now Chair of Memory and Brain Function, and the Vice President of Research at the University of South Carolina. We're just so fortunate to have him in the state of South Carolina in the university. Uh, leading the research there. He is the, also the director of C Star, and also he co-directs the University of South Carolina Hospital Center for Brain Imaging. His research examines the effects of stroke uh, in everyday life in developing new treatments for stroke survivors, and with us being in the stroke belt, I guess there's no better place than to be doing that research and that work. Much of the research is focused on communication, something that very often is affected by stroke. Uh, also next is uh, the one and only Dr. Tom Mulligan. And uh, again, this is abbreviated bio for him. As a senior environmental attorney, author, professor, board of and documentarian, where his law practice and academic research has taken him to every continent Owner. He's been inducted as a fellow in the Explorers Club, a fellow in the Royal Geographical Society, and has been engaged as a National Geographic expert. Expert in many different things, but that's the best, that particular one has been recognized by the National Geographic Society. He's led environmental expeditions to every continent, delivering lectures on environmental issues and concerns worldwide. He has logged certified scuba dives in every ocean and has summoned the world in 20 mountains. In his spare time, he has been the founder and the board chair of GEA and the founding chair of the South Carolina Governor's Floodwater Commission. You heard about that earlier today. He is currently a professor at the University of South Carolina, also at Coastal Carolina University, and the University of San Francisco in K2. K2 Papakos campus. A retired Major General Mulliken is a decorated senior military officer. And again, could go on and on. And to the far right there uh, is been a pleasure to have with us today is Dr. Travis Knight, who is the department chair at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Knight's research and interest are in the area of advanced nuclear fuels and materials, reactor safety, nuclear safeguards, nuclear fuel cycles, alternative uses of nuclear power, including synthetic fuels, hydrogen production, space, nuclear power, and propulsion. Dr. Knight is the director of the Nuclear Engineering Program. So we're really so fortunate to have such a distinguished panel. And I'm going to take my seat to the far and just listen and uh, uh, to their work. So whoever's going to kick it off. Yeah, here I can start. I just want to start by um, saying how great it is to see everybody here. I was a little bit surprised showing up. How many people are here? That's wonderful. I showed up in the morning with cowboy boots this morning. I just went back quickly to my hotel room. Understand? Tom had told me wearing jeans was perfect. <coughs> um, so what does a neuroscientist do on a panel about energy? Just to uh, address that real quick. So I'm the Vice President for Research at the University of South Carolina. So that includes all of our research as a whole. Um, we do a lot of research in the energy space. Also, just in environmental health in general. I get to work with really talented people like Travis. Uh, we actually have a small army of folks who work on anything from energy generation to distribution and storage. For us, that's a huge deal. I was very lucky that last year, um, I was one of the leaders in getting what is called SC Nexus up and going. Um, that started at the University of South Carolina. As 
that came along as an opportunity. We simply looked around what were the different areas that would work well as far as solving South Carolina problems, because that's the, the business that the university is in. And we looked at energy, which was one of the things that you could ask for a designation on. And for us, it made a lot of sense. We know that the energy needs for the state are pressing. We know that we have an, a bit of an uncertain future, but we want the University of South Carolina to be a part of the solution for the state. So that's why we went with energy. I think that we were very fortunate to get that designation as a, a tech hub. One, one out of 31 with over 400 applications. We're very much looking forward to seeing what SC Nexus can do for the state moving forward. Um, there is a, a, a lot of federal funding that's available through that effort, and we're hoping to capitalize on it. But the truth is that the work really all will go to people like Travis, and he's the expert, I'm not. Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about nuclear. I guess I'm more than happy, though, in my role as chairman, my department is mechanical, aerospace, and nuclear engineering. So, as chairman, I get to promote good work that others have been doing, but I think probably here today I'm, I'm representing probably the, the nuclear pillar, um, which, um, like the other departments, other program, aerospace, that in my department has its ups and downs. And having been in Mount some 30 years, you count back to my days as a in the year. I think I've been in the to see many ups and downs. It's kind of like uh, one got a song this morning in your session that uh, reminded me of the one from the Rambos. So one more valley, one more hill. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, I think the, the good thing is that in, in South Carolina, we're uh, very blessed that uh, be a, uh, a, a very <coughs> nuclear friendly state. Uh, look at Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, we're the highest per capita in terms of nuclear engineers, uh, operators, technicians. There's quite an investment in jobs uh, and infrastructure, uh, and so the opportunity to, to, to leverage that and to build upon that in future opportunities such as both the Nexus and others um, is, is great. Um, I think if you look around the landscape, more than 50% of our electricity comes from nuclear power in South Carolina. Uh, and that's considering overall in our country, you know, the U.S. is 20%. Uh, so there's some substantial investment, but uh, I think the, the future does look great. I think we're, we're approaching that, that mountain top locally uh, in, in that because of the many good things that it portends. Uh, that is low greenhouse gas emissions. That's one of the greatest probably uh, interests uh, maybe for folks like this in terms of stewardship of the environment. Um, is, is the, the many benefits that it brings in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and reduced other pollutants. So, um, <clears throat> factor of maybe 100 times less than the total to people per kilowatt hour. The other factor I would, I would champion or highlight here is, is the idea of uh, resiliency right, uh, and, 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 sustain, uh, and uh, security. Uh, nuclear power is very reliable, has the highest capacity factors. Uh, that's why it's being um, advocated for in many corners, such as you now use in, for example, data centers that have to you know, operate 24-7. You know, um, uh, obviously, you know, when you put the switch, you want that power to be there. So the power is that uh, ability, again, to be that 24-7 base load support. Um, the other thing that's come to light more recently is national security. I think there's lots of innovations being brought in terms of micro-reactors, small model reactors, um, and, uh, aimed at uh, the national security, uh, understanding that a lot of our infrastructure is vulnerable uh, to folks that don't like us so much. Uh, and, uh, understanding that, for example, we could be cut off from some of our access to the Pacific, or even last us in some of the scenarios. The good bit of a nuclear is that you, know, you carry most of your fuel supply with you. Uh, it's very compact. Uh, you can have years stored on site. In fact, uh, so you're not going with those fuel supply missions. Um, we know that in Operation Iraq Freedom in Iraq and Afghanistan, Iraq, well, the 10% of the casualties came from the resupply of energy and fuel. So, nuclear is again very expensive as a the other factor is, is, is 
assist uh, effectively. It's, it's good jobs. I think you know, aside from the fact that we're a new in Texas State in terms of jobs, uh, these are high tech jobs. They're uh, well paying. They're good for the community. We'll find that in those communities that house nuclear power plants, um, they're very uh, receptive to them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for coming out. You know what, why? Why energy when we're here to talk about the environment? Uh, and there's very good reasons. And this is a critically important conversation for the environment and for the economy. And it's it's complicated. So what what brings us here? We we talk a lot about climate, and I'll just briefly mention that. Uh, talk about nuclear. We had a minor nuclear disaster in South Carolina called Summer 2 and 3. It is still a dark cloud that we operate under. Uh, unfortunately, that had two AP-1000s that didn't go forward. Um, where we got about another 2200 megawatts. So we have a little bit of history that has complicated advancement, um, and that's part of it. So why here? We have a global atmospheric issue of climate and as part of that, as the state, we have looked at how do we establish a model in South Carolina where we can demonstrate global leadership on that macroatmospheric issue while also dealing with the micro manifestations of that here in South Carolina, the flooding, coastal erosion. And if you, you look at that issue of climate, we've tried to bring this conversation along in South Carolina by teaching people as we hike each year from the mountains to the sea. It's been my experience in talking about this around the world that some of the people who are most passionate about climate and greenhouse gases don't know what they are. And just as a redneck lawyer from Camden, I, I have come to the conclusion that if you don't know what they are, you're probably not going to reduce them. So we talk about that, and if you don't mind, if you'll just bear with me. The UN follows and tracks six greenhouse gases. There's more than six, but we track six. Uh, as part of our UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that's three naturally occurring, three synthetic gases. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but if you allow me, I'll, I'll take us from this to all the way back to energy. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and three fluoride gases, synthetic gases of perfluorocarbon, hydrofluorocarbon, and sulfur hexafluoride. Those gases make up the blanket, they're the fibers in the blanket that surround Earth which is what NASA refers to as our atmosphere. It's really like a five-layer cake. And they keep the sun's radiation pressed. I'm saying this in front of Hope, in front of all these people to score. They're probably going to get graded on this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Not okay so far. So that becomes a global issue. But that global issue is then uh, has micro-manifestations. And that requires you to know not just the six greenhouse gases, but where are they coming from? Because that becomes very important too. And there's six of those. So you got six and six. And that's a piece of that, a large piece of it. It's not the largest is energy. So you have transportation is the largest. Industry and energy, which is really the same thing, and we'll talk about that. And then agricultural, commercial, and residential. So what brings us to this conversation about energy? What really brings us here is the environment. In the environment, we are at a cross, crossroads where the environment is putting tremendous pressure on energy sources, on energy sources and energy users. And if you look at our grid, the lion's share of that is being used by people who are employing South Carolinians, large energy intensive industry. And that also complicates it. But we're here now because this is largely an issue left to the states. And so if rooms like this can't have an informed conversation about energy, we are all in a very difficult situation. So let's talk about that. That brings us from the climate, through the gases, through the sources, through state regulation, and now here we are with two experts. We uh, have got to figure out how to convert a grid that had largely been historically dependent upon fossil fuels, and we have reduced four coal plants, and we're still at three to take off the grid. And 
replace that energy at the same time we're the fastest growing state on a percentage basis in the country. Complicates. It also is complicated because we now have rapidly moved into being the emo town of the world with electric vehicles, which will also put more pressure on the grid, and then that gets you around the data centers, which is its own conversation, and the enormous energy users. And all of this, I would tell you, because of great leaders like Senator Alexander, who not only serves as the president of the Senate, but as the chairman of the Public Utility Review Committee, we can harness this energy. And we've done that, and we're doing it now. We have the largest percentage reduction of anthropogenic interference of any state in the country. Anthropogenic interference, human releases of, and we've done it, so you kind of, okay? But largely in the energy sector by replacing coal plants with utility scale solar. Since I'm pretty much retired from practicing law, I can share with you that we've not only done that, but at the same time become more economically efficient because coal is generating now at about 3.2 cents a megawatt and utility scale solar at about a penny megawatt. So we've been able to do that. But it is true for the antagonist, it's very true that if the sun's not shining, we're not generating. And so storage becomes a very big issue, just like with wind. And wind is something that needs to be put. So you hear people looking that are talking about the same energy from all sources. And what Travis and his team that becomes such a global influence on is now small modular reactors. But it, it's always curious to me when we talk about greenhouse gases for those that are the most passionate about greenhouse gases that they don't know about it. I'm equally puzzled by people that say we need to convert the grid that don't know how large the grid is. So if you want to talk to me about we need to replace, what is our use? Because that becomes a very important part of the calculation. In South Carolina, with SC7, we've tried to, to move the conversation along and bring people along. But here's what I'll tell you now after our fifth and a couple thousand miles into this. If we push too far and we push ourselves into brownouts or, God forbid, blackouts, the coal plants are going back on, online because it, it's going to push the conversation beyond people's comfort level. So in South Carolina, my brother's right, since he's here, I can blame him, my, my brother Cam's a chemical engineer. We use on any given day about 11,000 megawatts. We know exactly what our coal plants are producing. We know that we're the fastest growing state. We know data centers are coming here. We want to be a global model for electric vehicles. So how do we take that 11,000, make it into about 15,000 megawatts, and do it with sustainable energy? And you don't do that without a lot of conversation about storage or continuous generation, like nuclear. So sort of within those four corners that I've given you, I've touched on a lot of subject, is a very important conversation. If we go with all solar, lithium batteries are their own environmental problem. And, and there are people now saying, so we've got to have a base load, we've got, to, we've got to lean forward, and we've got to allow for the growth, why, why do I say we have to do it? Is that my political opinion? Or is that based on the nuances of the market? Years ago, Congress began looking at this and the Waxman Market Bill, well, and they were going to force and still doing this through regulations uh, under the Clean Air Act, which has been litigated. It largely hasn't created a lot of pressure on the market. But 2012, those that were very sophisticated said, we'll go to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And they began an effort there through shareholder lawsuits and board resolutions to put pressure on publicly traded companies through reports to the SEC where they have to disclose what their footprint is, and then board resolutions that require reductions. And now we have companies operating here that are saying, we're going to reduce our footprint by 50% by the year 2030. And that is a very aggressive goal. And for them to do that, they're going to have to do it through the energy piece of what their, for what their emissions are. And so for us to be a global leader, moving into clean energy 
is going to invite some of the best opportunities for economic backpack. And if we don't do it, we're going to lose those. So how much is that? We have a lot of steel in South Carolina, believe it or not. People don't look at us as a Pittsburgh. We've got some very large steel. And one of those companies is all recycled steel. All recycled. What is their, what is their uh, energy usage? Well, they're paying about six to eight million dollars a month in their in their in their light bill, and what they need to operate is about 120 megawatts. So thanks, City of Columbia. So for us to do this, we've got to move aggressively to find those, and it requires it's a conversation. I do not. Oh man, they don't know about this. They should come to the revival. Uh, sorry about that. I get past it. Virginia is not too old to be past it. So you know. They're allowed to. Yeah. 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 We're going to drown them out. <laughs> <laughs> this is a battle of bands going on yeah. here. So we've got Security and Exchange Commission. We've got EPA. We've got the PSC here. We've got ORS here. We've got SCI system. Dr. Friedman, a little bit of honesty. He didn't have a little bit of it. He created the whole thing. And then he put it together. And somehow or another, we've got to do all of this while bringing the public on and ensuring that we don't have riots. Because that becomes, we're not California. Right? California does that, and there's a large part of the population that says it's just part of, it's part of the consequences of change. I don't think South Carolina's going to do that. So we need to be, we need reliability has to be a big part of it. And that's a separate issue. And it's within those issues that we find a very complicated conversation all starts with the environment. SEC and, and these, board, these board resolutions are what's driving that change. That's not Tom Mullins' position on all of this. We're going to lose a lot of opportunities that we have here. Nuclear is a big part of it. And beyond that, we need to talk about storage. And in solely, we need to be talking about dual use. We can be smart. And honestly, the, the challenge that we have in this subject is that most people that come to the table are selling services, not solutions. Doesn't mean that their services are part of the solution, but their service is just that. They're selling solar, they're selling gas, they're selling wind, they're selling lithium. And somehow or another, as a, as a community, we've got to put these pieces together that it is a very complicated fabric to find out what's best for our state. Because as I said, from the start, we are on our I'm on our own island with this. And we need people like Dr. Greenwood, <coughs> Dr. Knight, and many others, some of whom are in this room, to put together that and to find what that future looks like. It is a complicated and you have to do it with some degree of humility because the person beside you may not have the exact same ideas. And if you step out and take a position, you need to step out understanding that people are going to criticize you for doing that. I'll share with you some some of the comments that I get. That's the way in broad terms the challenge, and that's why we just want to have the conversation start, because it's not an easy conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Is that okay? Perfect. Let me just touch on something that we've talked about. Um, um, we talked about data centers. Yes, sir. So when we're talking about energy, increasing energy demands, I don't think we fully appreciate the demands for data centers. Um, there are two things in relation to that. First one is AI, and then just the storage today. So ChatGPT has now been around for what, less than two years. I'm sure that most of you have used ChatGPT. There are now hundreds of large science models on the market like it. There will be thousands within a couple of years. To train one of these large science models is tens of millions of dollars. Where's the most of that cost? It's in the energy that it takes to run this supercomputing cluster. That's not going away. It is not going away, it's only going to increase. So, when you think of OpenAI and Microsoft getting into the small modular nuclear reactor space, you know they're serious. So you know, right now, Microsoft is starting to hire people like, like Dr. Nine. Why? Because they, they clearly see for them, for their business model to make sense, they need so much energy that for them to set up their own small modular nuclear reactor, they see what the future is. In the, for most of us, this is just going to come off the right. And you guys The other one is data storage. 
Right now, about 40% of all data are stored in the United States. The amount of the, the increase in data per year is about 36%. So that's worldwide. That means that we're doubling the amount of data that we store every 10 years. That's not a linear increase, that's an exponential increase. So it's easy to see that in the future, we are going to need a lot more energy to run those data centers. People talk about cloud storage. Well, cloud storage actually lives somewhere. It lives on servers somewhere. And they're all over the place. Right now, the data centers in the United States take as much power to operate as the whole country of Argentina. So it's easy to see what the future looks like. There is going to be a huge increase in demand for energy simply because of this. I don't see how this trend will be reversed. I just wanted to touch on that. And, and, and if I could kind of yes, start on that as well, too, on the data centers, that and the amount of energy they use. Um, and we have them come into South Carolina, I have them in South Carolina, I have them continue to come, continue to look at South Carolina. The number of jobs they create is very small. Mm -hmm. There are 30 to 50 jobs versus the scout motors at 4,000. Things of that nature. But what they also do is they're very attractive to the local communities and the counties because it's a very high tax base for those. So <coughs> part of the discussion coming after these clear is that for us to make sure that the energy capacity is there for these centers. Uh, and it is part of the national security from that standpoint as well, too, versus other responsibilities with the state, state level trying to entice additional data centers to come here. And, I, and at the same time, when you talk about reliability and affordability, that has to be a part of the mix as far as what we look at from, from a regulatory standpoint is that reliability, affordability, availability. Mentioned, we, we, we kind of also want to go to the comments about summer unit two and three not being completed to the tune of 2,200 megawatts of electricity. Guess what our need is today for additional energy? I mean, roughly 2,000 to 2,200 megawatts. And we're going to need that sooner rather than later. So there is a fault that is there all of those units are not online. And I do believe Certainly, the small nuclear reactors are going to be a part of having that opportunity once they're developed. I, I come from the area of the United State. Um, we have three nuclear reactors there. Uh, and they're coming, they're coming one, two, and three. First reactor's been online now for over 50 years. We have hydro as a part of that mix there as a result. We have lakes that really help from, from the flooding uh, when we have a lot of rainfall in those mountains, in the foothills of mountains, uh, it's a good management tool for us to mitigate some of the flooding. So, so there, as you mentioned earlier, this is a very complicated issue and there's a lot of different dynamics. But, but I agree with one of the things too, there's many of the things, especially what Tom said. I'm not for roundhouse and blackouts. You talk about when we, if and when we get in that situation, that's a whole different discussion. And uh, to that, many times when you go in to a room, you automatically turn that light switch and you don't think twice about that electricity coming on. We've got to make sure we the growth of the population, the leadership of our governor and, and individuals. These that are coming on board, you can't have it both ways. You, you got to make sure that that grid and that production is, is there for the future. So, if uh, not, we're going to be behind it. Any questions? Yeah. If I could just go on that, <clears throat> I think you need to know, Sick, there, that the best battery is water. Uh, mm -hmm. And I understand it's also some of these pump storages is, has the ability to expand. Power and some of 
cited for the 2030s. Okay, um, I think so. Licensing issues. So all these these various 70 plus companies, they're going to that or, or about to start or somewhere in that licensing uh, process. Um, we have proposed uh, there are some other pathways uh, through Department of Energy or Department of Defense where if you have certain strategic interests, you can warrant in South Carolina having a uh, Earth site, uh, certain National Guard facilities, uh, again, certain data centers within our vicinity and region that have a, a national security role that, that, that provide services to those three letter agencies. Um, I think you could justify certain under that being a first mover in that arena. You know, who can pay you know, those higher prices to, to get this thing moving you know, it is those military applications, national security applications. Uh, I think South Carolina is front and center for a prime place where they can uh, test bed and demonstrate that and collect that data that's needed, the research that's needed to move forward for commercial licensing and maybe fast track the commercial licensing uh, to grow this uh, resource for us. Uh, so I think I would say that for all these reasons, I think SMRs are key. Uh, and it's going to be, again, these, 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 these situations where you have customers that can, can uh, justify and pay for this, you know, maybe, maybe condition higher for cost for you or whatever. Uh, I could talk about our research there as well, if anyone is interested, but uh, I'll, I'll have a pause. How big or how small are these things? Are they, can they eventually, are they going to be residential as well as small industrial? Or I mean, do they manufacture them elsewhere and come and drop them in place and turn the switch and you're ready to go? Can you give us an idea of what you're really thinking and talking about? Yeah, so I think I, I mentioned small modular reactors, 50 to 300 megawatts. These have uh, a smaller footprint, as you indicate. You know, these could be you know a few acres in, in size, even uh, probably more like your ten water meter. I think as much. Not maybe not as much, maybe not as much as the blue board, but I think well, certainly not scale. You know, they're, they're all either they're smaller size, so but we're not far as much. Uh, so so yes, yeah, smaller footprint. I mean, nuclear by itself is a smaller footprint, obviously compared to solar. If you were to replace all the nuclear plants in South Carolina, you would need to be in a solar region that's bigger than Richmond County. Uh, that's a reduced capacity factor, not to mention the infrastructure being around it. Uh, again, all of the above, not, not, not yeah, just, for, just for perspective, yeah, to understand perspective and scale. Um, I think so, so certainly smaller footprints, you're not going to see in your neighborhood, I think, I think was your question. Um, you're not going to see it one in my basement or anything like that. Um, but uh, certainly certainly distributed, which promotes stability of the grid. Um, there is also micro reactors, which are less than 50 megawatts, and that's where you're seeing those uh, certain military applications, certain maybe, uh, you, you can envision that maybe as, as a backup for a hospital or, or, or a secure supply for a hospital or some or a military base or uh, even a data center uh, as well. Uh, there is Project Pele, I will say, that is a Department of Defense uh, effort. Uh, that reactor will be turned on in early 2025. Uh, it, it's of a different design. Uh, I think about nuclear, what's old is new, because you know, a lot of this, the, the technologies, there are lots of thorium and, and high temperature reactors. These were actually demonstrated, you know, going back many, many years. Um, I think we have lightweight reactors thanks to a brick over in the Navy, and that's a good thing. Commercial, again, commercial nuclear power is very safe, it's very reliable. Uh, but there are advanced designs. So these advanced designs, we call advanced designs, um, have other advantages, higher efficiency, um, improve safety, and I don't like to talk about safety because let's not to impute that uh, the current reactors are not safe, they are absolutely safe, proven safe. But um, they are of a design that is called inherently safe. Um, and these uh, high temperature reactors, the type that is being led by the Department of Defense. Uh, they have one other advantage, or multiple other advantage, but one is this is high temperature. So X Energy in partnership with Dow Chemical and proposed Ford in the Texas uh, Big Ben region uh, support their operations because uh, they need high temperature process heat as well as electricity. So there are those applications and so a lot of these advanced reactors 
benefit from these um, more than just electricity production. Uh, there is one, uh, or, or you were Kairos, 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 Kairos uh, in your slides this morning, but that's the name of the company. They're a high temperature reactor company also. They're building the Tennessee. So you've got Texas, Tennessee, Wyoming is building a higher temperature reactor, but with a slightly different design, it's a sodium cool design. That's actually funded by Bill Gates. Uh, so, you know, I, I think South Carolina, we hope South Carolina will be part of the, one of those. So, so production in Texas, Tennessee, Wyoming, I think uh, whether ours is going to be a bad event, it's not good, but uh, I think, uh, hope I answered your question. I'll, I'll start you all with uh, address the elephant in the room right now, which is uh, where uh, a uh, mega methane gas plant on the Edisto River and pipelines through the Ace Basin, which might be more direct to the senator. Where does that where does that play a role in this energy mix? Here in the energy mix, but I'm also seeing you know kind of this barreling down of this legislation that also uh, has within it uh, the ability for the monopoly utility companies to bypass a lot of the oversight by the Public Service Commission. So I was hoping that you guys might address this since this is happening right now and likely will be brought up before the next legislative delegation uh, before the legislature comes back in the session in, in January. Uh, I personally don't, don't think it's a good thing, but I was hoping to hear you all's uh, expert opinions on that. I'll just say, I mean, we got to have capacity, uh, and there are different ideas, different thoughts on that. Uh, that is in the conference committee. I uh, don't know that there'll be any resolution of that. I think over the fall we'll be getting additional information from that standpoint. But even with the technology, and, and I think as I heard uh, Chair here say that, that even with Duke having a potential for one in the thirties. There is going to be this delta, and as I mentioned, that 2,200 megawatts that did not come online. I mean, it wasn't for down the road and not being needed. I mean, there is a need for that. So I think the question is, how do you how do you do that? Natural gas uh, is has been and probably will continue to be part of that solution from that standpoint. The Senate's looking at that legislation. Um, there's different views on exactly what that uh, uh, aspect of, of the regulatory component of that, and I think that'll be up for some review by us, but, but a lot of that is not, not uh, short-circuited, uh, or at least appears not to be short-circuited in the PSC process, but bringing certainty to the time element of when decisions will have to be made from that standpoint. That's something we will continue to look at and evaluate from the path of the board. So, because there are things that resulted uh, out of um, the past that we do not want to repeat. And so we probably are bringing a little bit different perspective in the Senate than what the House did. But the fact that there is something in conference demonstrates the need is there. We recognize that we've got to have additional capacity in that and natural gas is probably going to be that short term solution, that delta between now and when the small nuclear reactors come online. We're going to continue to be successful here. Is it, is it true though that the, the gas plant would take eight to ten years to perform? first electricity to come from it? Uh, well, I mean, it's not going to be next year. That's right. Because, I mean, but I mean, almost a decade? Um, I'm not sure exactly on that on that aspect. It could be up to that period of time. But again, a, part, a lot of that is the permitting process that can uh, prevent that from going forward on a more timely basis. So I think all of those things have to be taken into account from that standpoint. But it will take time, even if and when it's permitted, it's going to, take, to your point, it will take time to build it. And that's the reason you're seeing some companies have it. But it's not a problem. The energy, I would say, too, and I don't know if they would agree with you. I mean, it's not just something that's unique to South Carolina. I mean, it's a Southeast issue as well, too. So it's not like you can just go and buy uh, 
an unlimited amount of power out on the grid to take care of us in the short term. And when I'm saying short term, and that's a good point, it's all relative as to when the uh, small nuclear reactors come on board. So, so typically, you're right, the, the, in two to three years is a good time frame for a natural gas plant. If anything can be done to shorten that time frame, it would have advantages to customers, clearly. Uh, I would say, again, if I were to speak for, for, for what I was here to speak for nuclear, I think the best uh, advantage we have is the fact that we have seven plants with 50% of the state. Keeping those going, relicensing them so that your plants in the upstate uh, there have been relicensed now or will be to 80 years. Uh, I think they just were. Um, so, original license for 40. I mean, the, again, capital, uh, nuclear plants are capital intensive, much like coal plants in some ways. Uh, but you can amortize, amortize over you know, many years, 40 years. Uh, they be, have been relicensed now to 60, and some probably uh, to the other 20 to 80 years. So, it's an investment in the future. Uh, so, if you look at the cost, if I can come back to small other reactors, again, they're going to have even more jobs, good paying jobs per megawatt because they are smaller. Uh, and even while the footprint is smaller, you know, the number of jobs you still need, you know, certain maintenance technicians and so on. So, but how you deal with those OEM costs, uh, how you produce those costs, but at the same time keeping good people employed, uh, that's an area of research at the university. But the, 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 really, the saving grace for nuclear is the fuel cost is so small compared to other. You know, natural gas, 9% plus of the cost is in the fuel. But we don't produce natural gas in the state. We don't produce coal in the state. Again, most of that cost is in the fuel. Uh, nuclear, and we might, we might not have nuclear mines either, but it's a small part. Our investment is in good jobs, at least when it comes to nuclear. Uh, so, uh, that, that, so I, I think have, you know, fuel costs are small. They're, they're, Stored above ground, we have years of supply, and in fact, a good paying job. But keeping those plants operating is key. And, and, and to your point, from that standpoint, I don't, I didn't want to um, uh, let it slide a while ago when we talked about new technology and the safety. Uh, I can assure you from having toured the facilities that have come in more numerous occasions, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and others that safety and updates that had, had to be done uh, to the facility there over the decades has certainly been uh, tremendous in, in making sure that they continue to operate in the same way. So. Let, me, let me go back to, if you don't mind, because I think you really, that really is where the metal meets the meat, what you're talking about, right? Because I hear what you're saying about the length of time. Is, like the time to build that going to render that obsolete versus another major investment, right? That, this is kind of how it shakes out. The other fact that you have to that you have to put in there is that we're at the same time taking coal plants now. So not only as the senator said do we have 2200 megawatt need now, that's complicated not just because of the growth, but because we're pulling three coal plants now. Um, as you look at the various options, which we talked about. Photovoltaic, we're talking about, I mentioned wind, talking about kinetic, we're talking about nuclear, we're talking about gas. We want, what gets left out a lot of times is the reliability. And if we're, if we're saying that we just, we don't want gas, we want solar, then we gotta talk about storage, right? At a utility scale. And now that gets you in the technology and gets you in the cost. So I have, been a part of a lot of conversations and there's no real easy answer on this. Because reliability, if it was just, if it was a singular linear issue, it would be easy, it'd be an easier conversation to have. But it's very complicated to reach an easy answer because of these various factors. These are difficult times for you. The, the growth factor is an issue. I didn't follow the, the piece that you you mentioned methane, so let, let me say this about methane because it's a big hit for me. Most of the methane that's being emitted uh, into the atmosphere around the world is coming off of landfills. And yes, yes. Uh, I don't know. It didn't. Okay. All right. Well, most of the land, most of the methane that is being emitted to anthrop that anthropogenic involvement. We can talk about other biodegradation. The stuff that we can deal with 
if you're talking about fugitive emissions off of pipelines versus landfills, we, I'd be happy to have the conversation. A large emitter, okay, so that you and I are on the same page. Technology's existed forever for cap and extract. I've done cap and extract. We could be pulling methane off of active landfills and putting it on the grid. We just hadn't done it. We've done a project in Alabama where we're taking methane off the landfill and putting it directly into an industrial facility. I'm, I'm happy to have a very long conversation about sort of where your concerns end or are mine, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to we're going to have to settle that reliability is a big part of that. And that's what makes this whole conversation very complicated while we're having this conversation. I, I understand and appreciate what you're coming from. This, I can, I'm not a legislator, but I think it's fair to say at this table that the mistakes made with the Boats Load Review Act are not going to be made. That's not ever going to happen. <laughs> that's what you're talking about. Well, the House passed version. That could very well have. You know, the Senate you gotta get it through the Senate. Had, had the Senate had stepped off and, and, and put, the, put the brakes. There, and the governor was supportive of this legislation, as as I understand it, as the House had. I, I can't speak for the governor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the timeline the issue, and again, you know, we've got some great experts there, but it, it, it sure seems like if we took the same amount of money and got very creative. And also required like industry to produce at least some energy on its site, such as the, the you know, I was thinking more along the lines of solar. We've got these massive roofs. Wouldn't solar be a quicker turnaround than all of the above? A lot of those big manufacturers are doing that. A lot of big manufacturers are doing that. Should we not be requiring them to at least produce us? You know, let, let's talk about that for a minute because that's a that's a big point. We talked about a large part of our our load requirements is industrial. You go to the smelter, they gotta have a 24 7 which means you go to some of the interruptible loads, you can have a conversation about that. But they're not they, those companies are, and we're talking about huge loads. The market is driving that way. Why? Because it's not just that they're paying five, six million dollars a month, but they're also coming at it because of the reduction of their greenhouse gas. And then you have a conversation about what is a major energy intensive manufacturer? We can debate this all day long, too. I, I know I'm, I can gather that I've been here with other people who know this very well. They would tell you that their, their emissions are about 2 million metric tons a year. I would say it's more like 5 or 6 million. But we'll go with 2 million for the sake of conversation. If they can't meet that off of energy, they have to buy carbon credit. And what is that? I, that's what I was Googling about our tanks. The, the range is anywhere from seven, seventy to $102 a ton on the London Exchange. I don't mean to get, so I want you to stay with me for a minute. Oh, if they I'm don't do it, I'm with you. and they have to, okay, if they don't do it and they have to buy a million tons, that's a large economic driver. That's a much larger driver than putting them before the PSC. They're going behind the grid. They are going to go behind the grid. It's a reliance in, 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 in somebody who's done projects behind the grid. So I think that industry is moving there as fast as they can, but they're gonna, a reliability is a big issue for them too. And that's, right now, this is what we have, lithium batteries. So for those of you who wanna talk about lithium, we're gonna talk about lithium mining because that's also not, a, a, that's making today's solution to be a bar's problems on that issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd like to respond to that. Yeah, that, is a, that is a talking point by the industry, by the fossil fuel industry. But, but once the... That's not a talking point. Well, well, don't put well, that out well, there. Well, 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 Considering all issues, don't yeah, have one, Once it's mine, it's 95. Now, that's not an industry talking point. you got to back up. That's not an industry talking point. That's a legitimate environmental and interest. But once it is mine, and I just saw something on the salt and sea, it's very interesting. Uh, it's 95% recyclable. So it's the front end cost of mining the lithium. Unlike non-renewable energy, that once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Once we have lithium, it's 95% almost endlessly recyclable. And that's a that's a talking point. The environmentalists and plastic is recyclable well, well, too. We're dealing about lithium and metric tons of that in the waters. Life cycle cost analysis, solar panels. Yes, ma'am. We've got about five minutes. Hi there. Well, this 
has been very interesting. I, am inter I work with a lot of companies that are looking at privatizing sort of their energy, moving away from grids in Europe as well. And are you all worried a little bit about so many private actors starting to create their own nuclear, small modular reactors, and sort of the the international implications of that, especially when you start to look at the lifespan of the fuel for all these reactors, the security of the transport, the of the fuel to and from. Can you talk a little bit about how those concerns are being addressed in sure. your leadership? Sure. I think you know, in terms of different actors getting involved, there's there's no concern. I would not say there's a concern there. We have the gold standard in terms of, of a regulator, the, the new director of commission. Other countries look to us for leadership. So being, being that we have the gold standard, just as I said, you know, even for the existing plants, the care that is taken there. Um, so I think that to address that point, um, there been fuel, there's been never been an accident in the fuel shipment. So I think we, South Carolina produces half of the nuclear fuel in this country, as well as fuel for Europe and other parts of the world. Um, 15 minutes from my office uh, there, there going to South Carolina. Um, so fuel shipments, I think, I would say not a concern in that sense. Uh, I'll forget your other point. End of, end of life of the fuel. So this is spent, so spent nuclear fuel. So it's, because nuclear fuel is very compact, the, the actual volume and amount of material, you can take everything that's been produced over the last 70 years and put it on a football field. It's, it's that small. And that sounds like a lot in some sense, but the coal ash from one nuclear, from one coal plant uh, for one year is, is, is five times that. So where is that fuel? Where is a way for that fuel? So, so there are companies that, that even in South Carolina are looking at future recycling of fuels. Uh, so it's not to say that it's not a technical challenge. It's really the fact that uranium is very cheap. Uh, it doesn't behoove us at this point to look to, and make the investments countries such as France that do recycle and they do it, they do it. So it's really a matter of economics right now rather than one of the fact that uranium is so cheap. So, so storage not a problem, you know, safety not a problem. Uh, it's really a function of what, what makes more sense in common. Okay. So um, I did recently talk to a national science and there is concern about the security of these models and actors and And people are starting to raise that one. So that is happening. Um, but beyond that, I just want to say, you know, that lithium is only one chemistry of batteries. There are dozens and dozens of chemistries of batteries being created. There's a company called Form Energy that I just found out about. They're using iron and oxygen. And they've got utility scale batteries. So these new batteries are coming, and they are going to be available. So um, I do think we need to have an all-the-above approach and, and look for these new um, chemistry. And I do want to make sure that we're including energy efficiency in the discussion. That is not what I'm hearing. And I do think that every state waits energy tremendous scales. We could probably shut down a whole power plant. Then we just turn lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous. I, I can answer so anyway, those just, questions. Yeah. As Dr. Fridge mentioned just now, stay tuned on the batteries issue. It's coming. Uh, we have innovators and researchers here in South Carolina that can address your battery issue at grid scale. Um, to the issue of, of international concern, you're always going to find somebody that's got you know a different opinion. But the immutable fact is Russia and China are doing this very thing. They are looking to provide these small modular reactors, even floating ones, to African countries, Ghana, which is a good thing. I think we should be doing that, and we could be doing that. Um, so it's a soft power influence that, that we need to have. So we can put our heads in the sand, but Russia and China are most definitely doing this. Okay, I think that's our time. I mean, it's, we've gone 10 minutes over. I think. <laughs> uh, I think.
on behalf of my family.